think that's where a lot of people go go bad with a pup. They throw them in a pen and just throw feed to them every day. And to me, you got to make a connection with them. Some guys don't agree with me on that, but I think you got to have a good bond with a dog. It's real simple, I think, with a pup, and a lot of people don't understand it. When a pup is ready to start, it will start. You can't force a pup to start, and you can't force a pup to treat. It has to do it on its own. Hello and welcome to the Stark Outdoors podcast. I'm your host Clayton Stark. It's been a while, but it's good to be back. Um, today I'm just going to be sharing a little bit of the story of the one of the young dogs I've been hunting. I actually have two really good young dogs I've been hunting. One of them is mine and his name is Tony. Tony Soprano is his full name. Um, he's a blue tick. He's out of Country Club, which is a Grand Knight Hall of Fame blue tick that's out of Big Country. And that's not going to be today's episode though. That'll be the next episode. Um, today's episode is focusing on another young dog I've been hunting since September. Uh, that's a walker, and his name is Lone Pine False Prophet. Uh, he's owned by Randy Smith, and I'll just kind of start from the beginning. It's been about a year now. Uh, last May, somewhere around there, um, I got together with Randy and made like a kind of a documentary on his kennels and his life and his career in coon hunting, and it was a really good time. Uh, we uh, were originally planned to go hunting just and do it all on a weekend and film all of his females that he has and we got a lot of it done on friday night and the following night or the following day saturday during the day my wife went into labor and i was five hours from home in pennsylvania so i uh, left and drove a little bit faster than the speed limit on the turnpike and made it to the hospital with about 30 minutes to spare got to see my third child born so that was Interesting, uh, interesting to say the least, but it was great getting to meet Randy and go hunting with him, and I'm actually getting together with him this weekend, taking this walker back that I've had, because it's, it's March 7th already, which is crazy to think time's flown that flown by that fast, but I've had this dog since September, like I said, his name is Lone Pine False Prophet, he is right at a year old now, um, he's been a real, real natural, he's out of world champion Davis's Rosedale Frogger, which if you follow any of my content, You've seen and heard about him, and if you want to hear more about his story, there's a podcast on here, too, where I interview Birchell Davis, the man that owns him, talks about Frogger a little bit. Um, you can also check out the videos on YouTube. I also recorded some podcasts with Randy Smith, and like I said, you can go to the YouTube, and I also recorded some podcasts with Randy Smith, and like I said, you can go to YouTube and just type in Randy Smith, Lone Pine Kennels, and it'll take you to my YouTube page, and you can see it more of him, and like I said, he has an amazing stable of females he's got a whole bunch of females that are some of the best females in the country including uh the lone pine lady which has won just about everything there is to win right now kind of on a hot streak she's handled by john strickland so prophet's dad is frogger and his mom is world champion lone pine biffy sue which is owned by randy smith so he's bred right he's out of a world champion dad and a world champion mom and i really like the way he's built he's a bigger size houndier looking dog with a red head and blanket back. He is very smart. Um, he's got a great mouth, but everyone probably assumed that being out of Frogger and Lone Pine stuff has good mouths too. And what I really like about both those lines of dogs is they actually have the ability to work a track. They will tree hot coon, but they're not going to run, run past stuff. Uh, they're not lazy. They're hustlers. You cut them loose. They fly through the woods and they tree coon as they come to them. Profit's been no different. Uh, when I got him in September, he had treed when I got him in September, he's treated a couple coon for Randy. And right now, as of March 7th, he is at 115 coon treed. And he will be, he's about 13 months old now, I guess. So I i have never had a dog other than maybe Jax come on that natural. I've never had a hound come on that natural. Jax is a mountain cur. Um, he was just a natural from the get-go. Prophet has been a natural too. He hasn't had... Many things to work on. Um, at first, when I first got him in September, uh, obviously the corn and beans and everything was on. So he was a little more tracky at first, but he was like five or six months old at the time. 
and it was really, really dry and rough, and it was hard on old dogs, but he he took right off, and just to kind of start off and give some more information on how he started and what I did, because that's something I want to do more often with my podcast and videos and all my content is discuss more of the pup training aspect and bring you along for the dogs that I'm working with and training and hunting for other people, because right now, uh, most of the coon hunting media in podcasts and videos it all seems to revolve around competition hunting and big money hunts and handlers and the dogs kind of get forgotten a little bit it's all about money and which is great i mean there's definitely a place for that but um there's a lot of people that watch and listen to the stuff i do and i know there's i get a ton and a ton of questions about starting and raising dogs and it seems like there's not a lot of stuff out there about it other than I, earlier I saw my Walk With Wick book sitting on my shelf. There's some stuff out there, but I, just, I need to focus and do a better job myself of being better to you guys and putting out quality information about starting and training dogs because the vast majority of people are not going to be able to afford, like me, not going to be able to afford to buy a finished dog or a dog that hunts the way you want to hunt. And honestly, to me, it's more rewarding to get a puppy and raise it and train it the way you want and see that whole process develop and it's a very rewarding experience and that's something i honestly want everyone to experience because if you're a new person and you get to see a dog kind of develop and grow and build that bond with them i think you'll be really hooked on it because most people in general like dogs there's not very many people that don't like dogs so i i always say this that if you just take a person that likes dogs and show them how beautiful and amazing it can be to train a coon hound or a squirrel dog um, they'll be hooked if their first experience is just competition hunts and they see that you have to have thousands of dollars to even enter a hunt and then they look at the cost of all the equipment and travel and how much a finished dog goes for they're not really going to be interested in getting involved with it because that is that's a giant investment up front so i think the best thing a person can do is Go with an experienced person that maybe has a finished dog to kind of see and get the feel of what's going on and find a good mentor if you're new to it. Um, that way you know what to expect and you can kind of learn and it's a lot of trial and error. A lot of the stuff I can share with you, it sounds great, but unless you experience some stuff, you just you have to know and experience it because it's such a relationship-based thing with your dog that unless you experience it, you're not going to know what to do necessarily, but I'll try my best to give you quality information and advice. Um, so I hope it helps. So I hope it really helps regular people out there get involved. And like I said, if you're new or thinking about getting involved with hunting with dogs, if you've seen my videos or listened to my podcast, um, it's, it really is one of the most rewarding experiences you can be a part of because like I said, everyone loves dogs. Um, it's great being outside. It's, a wonderful journey there's different stages in a dog's life like when you first get them you can teach them like we'll get into kind of what i do but you can teach them basic obedience stuff and then all the way till the late stages of life all the different phases and things you see in a dog's life it's it's really beautiful and it's something that i hope everyone can get to experience at least a few times in their life so that's just kind of what i'm doing going forward um nothing's really going to be different i'm just going to be doing a better job focusing on helping you guys and answering questions. And I don't know everything. The things I talk about is just things that I have seen work for me and other people over the last 30 years of doing this. Um, I've traveled a lot and hunted with a lot of top people. I've interviewed most of the top people that hunt dogs and I've been on a lot of big casts and seen all the different styles of dogs. And I've tried to be like a sponge and absorb as much information as I can. And a lot of stuff was pretty much just reinforcing what I already thought and believed that was taught to be by my dad and my uncles growing up because this is something I've been doing my entire life and dad was the same way we never really bought finished or started dogs we kind of just got whatever we could as far as a pup and raised it and trained it ourselves, and that's just what we did and always do and never really I never even got into a competition hunt until I was in my early 20s I put Jackson a few because he was a really good coon dog and put some wins on him um then a few other people had me hunt some hounds for them and just four or five competition hunts but i don't to me i could never enter another competition hunt again and i'd be perfectly happy because what i'm about to talk about is what really pumps me up and makes me happy and the reason why i do it and love it so back in september i got profit um randy brought him to the world hunt and 
dropped him off at Trevor Hack's house. And once I got done with the final cast, I went to Trevor Hack's and got profit and brought him home. Most people, when they hunt a dog for someone else, um, they, they advertise a certain price and how often they'll hunt a dog a week. And I'm a little different. And I used to hunt dogs for just the general public when I was in college, but I don't really do that anymore. I just hunt for close friends and people I know personally because you just get a lot of weird stuff and people with unrealistic expectations, to be honest. To me, if you're hunting a young dog, you don't really put a set number of days a week you hunt them. To me, you don't really just put like a set number of days a week you hunt a dog. It's more of, I look at it more of the process of the dog's development throughout the course of the time I have it and it's early life. What I did with Profit in the beginning, I would just go every other night or maybe go one night and then give him two nights off, just depending on how he acted. And then once he started being more consistent with what he was doing, then I would do it more often. So for example, like I said, when he got here, the corn was on. Uh, beans were on and really this year it was so it was dry in the beginning and then it got super wet late in the fall so there was crops on until close to Thanksgiving which is uncharacteristic for this for this area um, so I just would cut them down different fence rows um, I mixed it up I'd turn them loose in the woods I turn them loose away from the woods just to keep it interesting for him and get him used to casting because a lot of times what some people do is they'll just walk up to the woods, into the woods, and just turn them loose over and over again. I try to make it different and mix it up a little bit. Once they start taking off from me decent, I'll really back up away from the woods like two or 300 yards and turn them loose just to get them firing off when I unsnap them. Just building good habits like that. So that's just kind of what I did starting out. He would go at first. You know how young dogs do. They get out in a cornfield and beat up a track for a while and then come out. And once he would get into the timber, he would work a track and he'd tree. And at first, if he'd tree one or two when I first got him, it was a good night. And then once he started getting a little more mature, because I don't I don't like pushing them super hard when they're really young. Once he got a little more mature, I would start recutting him more and more. And then once he showed me that he could tree a couple back to back, um, then I started hunting him more every other night to every once in a while to go back to back nights. And once he started stringing them together, then I started probably around eight or nine months old. I started hunting him more like an older dog where you might just turn him loose two or three times in a section. If you have the space, I would try and get him to tree two to five coon every time I took him out from that point on once he was about eight months old from about six to eight months old. That was a lot of just getting used to riding in the truck because he did get car sick at first. So it was getting him over that, getting him used to being here and being around me and just the routine of loading in the truck and wearing a collar and what we're doing, just kind of building those good habits. And then once he started, he got all that down and the, the coon training was coming naturally. So it was just a matter of uh, doing my part and getting him out there and keeping him straight. And then from eight to 10 months old, it was just gradually working more and more, trying to make sure every time I took him out, the last thing he did was tree a coon. So if he treed, say, two or three, if it had been a while and I knew they weren't moving very good, I didn't turn them loose anymore because I didn't want to take a chance in him running junk or just being stagnant and then me having to catch him. I like anytime I'm working a young dog, if the last thing on their mind when they go out in the woods is being treed and you petting and loving on them or rewarding them with fur in their mouth um that to me that's a step forward i just try and make sure every trip i make to the woods that they make a little just make a little bit of progress over time and that's pretty much what profit has done and that went into kind of the winter months then and to be honest this year it was a little rough um a lot of people in the area were struggling to tree some and he does something that i really haven't seen really any other dogs i've had do before if he trees a den tree or say in a hole or a brush pile or trash piles or old farm equipment, which is gonna happen if you're in the northern part of the country hunting in December and January because that's just where they go to survive. But one thing this dog did that I haven't seen a lot of other dogs do, when he did that, it was six to eight times total that I've had him where he's been in something like that. He has never not shown me a coon. I've never went to a hole or anytime I've went to a place like that, there has been a coon sitting there so it's just he's had an uncanny ability even with den trees he's made on rough nights that you can look in the tree and you can see the coon there or he's made some den trees where the coon are sitting on the outside of the den i don't know i don't know why but he he just has a 
uncanny natural ability at having having it there when you get there even in most situations i'm not like other dogs to be doing it i mean obviously if it's a den tree or there's a hole or something they can just go in there where you can't see them but it just seems like there was always something there like one time i never had this happen before either cut him loose he went and treated a coon about 300 yards away it was a really rough snowy nasty night um recut him off that tree he went probably 200 yards off of that and I could tell he was barking in a hole and when I got there it was an old rotted out tree stump that there was a hole that was inside of the stump that kind of went down into the right a little bit and he had his head down in there so I so I leashed him up and pulled him back and you could see there was fur down in there so he just he has a good nose and a good natural ability at finding coon he's a natural and I really look forward to getting him back to Randy so he can hunt and have some fun with him. So as you've heard, he's been a very natural dog. I pretty much just took him to the woods because he was ready and spent time in the woods with him and let him develop on his own. I think that's a important thing to note. There are some dogs out there that are bred so well and are natural that you can just take them to the woods and just spend time with them and they will just start doing it. There's other dogs like my blue tick. He was also a natural early starting dog, but I started him differently and I'll talk about how I started him and got him going. It was more of some of stuff that I did that helped get him started when he did start. So that'll be the next podcast. I'll talk more about him because it's really neat that I've gotten to hunt both these young dogs at the same time. They're almost the exact same age. One's a blue tick, one's a walker. One just started doing it on his own pretty much. The other one started treeing a little bit in the yard and then I did a few things with him to help move him forward. So you get, you're going to get a little bit of both sides because there are some, like I said, there are some just complete naturals where you don't got to do much to, and there's others that they're natural, but you can help move them along and bring up their natural instincts and just move them forward and make gradual progress with them. So since I've had him, it's like I said, it's September through March now. So I had him late summer type hot, dry conditions into the fall into the winter and now into the spring i've gotten to see how he hunts and handles and what he does in different conditions and i've seen him look good and handle look good and handle things really well honestly the the thing that impressed me the most was probably the late fall going into winter because at that time of year it had been super dry and obviously it gets really cold here it was a very 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 bad time for young dogs and all the old timers and anyone in the area that's been doing this for an amount of time said that this is probably one of the worst coon seasons they've had. I've cut him loose and have him go in there and slam one that's on a small tree that you knew he just ran up on and, and ambushed. I've also taken him out, like I said, when there's three or four inches of snow and ice on the ground and nothing's moving. There's no tracks on the ground and just fall tree, tree and layup type coons on the outside of den trees or in den trees. So he's... He's done both. Like I said, he's a very smart dog. So he's a type of dog that can read you. If you're happy with him, he's going to be happy. If you're a little upset, he's going to be a little upset. He's very in tune to what you are doing more than other dogs. There, Most dogs are that way, but some of them are more than others. Some of them, they just operate and act fine and don't really pay attention to you that much. They seem to be able to read people's emotions a lot better. So with this dog, the better connection you built and the happier you are around him, And the more you love on him and stuff, the better he performs because he wants to please you and he likes making you happy. So that's just something that you can keep in mind too. And like I said, I can tell you all this stuff, but there's nothing that can replace actually experiencing it yourself. And there's a lot of people out there on Facebook and the internet in general that will try and give people advice and tell them what works. And there's even some people out there that spend a lot of time telling people what doesn't work and their way their way is the only way that works and they get pretty argumentative and combative and it's really just a waste of time because um, you can give great general information but my biggest thing I can biggest piece of advice I can give you is just spend time with your dog and develop a good bond and take them hunting take them out in the woods and listen to your dog because that's that's what you're working with. That's what the beautiful thing is about this. And that that's what makes a dog is you and your dog and the connection you build and the time you spend in the woods. It's not necessarily what people on the internet say. Um, it's not anything else besides what you do in the woods with your dog and 
Sometimes that means not taking them to the woods, knowing when to lay off a little bit and when they're acting a little burnout or if they're developing some sort of junk problem. If you know that coon aren't moving and it's going to up the chances of them running junk or if they need pushed a little harder and you need to go a few more nights in a row, that's that's all experience and just don't overthink it. Just pay attention to your dog and go have a good time. And I encourage you, if you have any questions out there, you can join my Patreon page. You can download the Patreon app on all the app stores and you can just look up Stark Outdoors on Patreon or you can just go to the website www.patreon.com slash Stark Outdoors. There's almost a thousand people on there now and it's a pretty nice community where we share ideas and tips and talk about all the dogs we're hunting and training and I post all my videos on there early and the podcasts are on there and it'll give you a chance to get in direct communication with me because there's on TikTok I have almost 70,000 people on there on Facebook. I have 40,000 people on there. So I don't even check my messages on Facebook anymore because I get so many of them a day that if I checked and tried to respond to everyone's messages, that's all I would do every day. So the, the best way to get in contact with me is on Patreon. So if you have a question or if you want to help me cover these hunts and travel around and interview people and help promote what we do and bring hunting with dogs and training dogs and hound hunting and coon hunting and squirrel hunting if you want to bring that into the mainstream and present that in a professional manner and show us for what we are and not let other people control the narrative about what we do you can support me on there and i just want to say thank you to those out there who have been longtime supporters and i've made a lot of friends through that and it's really been a great experience so if you're listening to this on patreon i encourage you in the comment section below if you have any specific questions about profit or anything else regarding training dogs just let me know. And like I said, with um, the next podcast is going to be about Tony. I'm going to cover more of methods about starting the dogs from the time they're pups and the more hands-on approach, I will say, to training a dog as opposed to just the natural natural dogs that are once-in-a-lifetime type dogs. So if you have any questions or comments or if you like this or hated it, um, just comment below and let me know. And I'll give you guys just kind of a brief update of what's coming up next as far as videos and podcasts. Like I said earlier, this weekend, which is tomorrow now, uh, be March 8th on Friday, I'm going down to Randy Smith's house. I'm taking profit back, and he has given me a driveline female that he wants me to hunt. So that'll be my next project as a young female pup, and I'm going to go hunting with him, and John Strickland's going to be there. We're going to do some pleasure hunting, and I'll make a video out of that for you guys, and record some podcasts um randy's also raising some pups so we're going to do something that i think will be really beneficial to you we are going to do a video that is just specifically on whelping puppies and raising puppies um randy is great with pups he has a great setup he has all sorts of tips as far as keeping puppies healthy and how to just make it easy on you so you know that you have the best chances of having a young healthy litter and that's something also that isn't really talked about much in the coon hunting media landscape It's pretty important, especially if you're just an average guy that is raising pups for yourself. It's a lot of good information to know, and I appreciate Randy for doing that. So that's what's coming up this weekend. Uh, I also will be covering the Tournament of Champions again, which I look forward to every year. That's coming up. I'll also be doing the interview with Legends at Walker Days this year. And depending on my schedule, I might cover the whole event, like go out and cast and stuff. So there'll be some videos for that too. I will also be getting together with Scott Engel once we have a free weekend here coming up. He's very busy with all his pro sport stuff and his kids, and I'm very busy traveling hunting too. So once one of these weekends lines up, we're going to get together, and I'm going to make two specific stud dog videos, one stud dog video for Echo and one stud dog video for Rodeo, and kind of talk about his competition hunting a little bit. That's another video coming up. I also have another Hounds in Spotlight with Danny Nichols, the man from South Carolina that's a great friend of mine that I go squirrel hunting with every year. I'm also going to be getting together with Kurt Ehring, He has built a pup pen at his place, so I'm going to go down there and check that out, and we're going to do another video with Kurt Ehring here in another month or so. I'm also going to try and get with Frank Giddings here in the next coming weeks. And, of course, there'll be more videos from that new driveline female I'm getting. Um, Also, a ton more videos of Tony the Blue Tick. There's a lot of product reviews coming your way, so there's really a lot of great stuff coming. And, like I said, thank you to those of you out there on Patreon that helped make this possible. I appreciate that I can be viewer funded and kind of be a voice for the community in a professional manner that represents us for who we truly are. And I appreciate you for giving me this opportunity. 
So this was just a quick podcast here as I'm finishing my coffee. I hope to hear from you guys in the comments below. And like I said, there'll be a lot more coming up. I know there wasn't a lot of pup training hands-on type methods, but that's important to note too. There are some dogs that the best thing to do is just take them to the woods and let them show you what they can do. And there, there's other dogs that require more hands-on method that we'll talk about in the next time. So thank you guys for listening and thank you guys for watching. And, and I look forward to hearing from you in the comments below and I hope you have a great day. He ended up treeing seven tenths of a mile. I had my light on coming in and he had another coon. So turned him loose three times, he had three coons. Ah, 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 ah,